Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today um, with our community conversations, our Office of Healthcare Equity. Um, the session will be recorded and uploaded to our community conversations website. I will put that link in the chat. In addition, this will be uploaded to our UW Medicine YouTube channel, and you can feel free to share that to anyone who was not able to attend today. Um, we have a really great topic today and an awesome set of panelists here. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A if there are any questions that you'd like answered um, during this session. And I will go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Chopra. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Conversations. Uh, we try to bring you more information about topics that are important to you. And today's topic is one such really important conversation on diabetes management. And we are so fortunate to have our wonderful panel with us. Uh, today, and uh, I'm so honored to introduce them. We have Dr. Savita Subramaniam. She's Professor of Medicine, Division of Metabolism, Endocrinology, and Nutrition. Welcome, Dr. Subramaniam. Thank you, Anita. Glad to be here. Uh, we have Dr. Lorena Wright, who will be joining us uh, in a little bit. She is Director, UW Medicine, Latinx Diabetes Clinic. Is Dr. Wright here? Right no, now. she's not. Uh, Priscilla, can you help her get on? She's uh, having trouble getting on to Zoom. Yep, I'm emailing her right now. Thank you. Uh, we have Whitney Thomas. Uh, Whitney is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator, and she practices out of multiple uh, UW neighborhood clinics. Welcome, Whitney. Thank you. And Priyasha Mahajan. Uh, Priyasha is student of Doctor of Global Health Leadership and Practice, and she's also a teaching assistant in the Department of Global Health at uh, University of Washington. Hello, Priyasha. Welcome. Thank you for having me here, Dr. Nita. I'm honored and to share this space with everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, Priscilla Estrada, who is our communication specialist in the Office of Healthcare Equity and who has made uh, this webinar possible. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, we'll try and bring as much um, information to folks as possible. And uh, we will try and uh, uh, talk about diabetes risk factors, management, and newer therapies. Uh, so Dr. Subramaniam, I would like to start uh, uh, by asking you, what are some of the risk factors that would predispose to someone developing diabetes? And how do we diagnose it? Okay. Um, thank you for that great question, uh, Dr. Chopra. Um, so there's, uh, first of all, um, there's two kinds of diabetes uh, in general. There's several others, but um, what's commonly known as type 2 diabetes is when, um, as a person um, gets older, um, the insulin that's made by the pancreas, the hormone that comes from the pancreas is insulin, doesn't work as efficiently, what we call insulin resistance. Um um, that is type 2 diabetes. Um, type 2 diabetes starts as pre-diabetes, and there are certain risks for that. Um, um, you know, age is, age is one, genetics. So if there's a family history, certain kind of, um, um, uh, you know, heritages, uh, and, you know, people of uh, South Asian heritage, um, people of Latinx heritage, um, are most common uh, people, Native Americans, uh, Pacific Islanders, these are all folks with uh, uh, with um, very high risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, those are uh, um, weight um, uh, people who are um, on the um, higher higher side on the weight can sometimes uh, that that is a contributor. So there, these are typically com um, common uh, reasons why someone might get type 2 diabetes. In women, specifically women who have gestational, developed gestational diabetes during pregnancy, women who have a condition, hormonal condition like PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, these are um, other risks for developing um, type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, which is uh, insulin deficient diabetes, uh, um, is a little bit more tricky. Uh, it can happen in children, adolescents, even in adults. Um, but there's uh, uh, there's really, a, if you have a tendency to develop what's called autoimmune um, conditions, you may develop it, but lots of times there's no family history. It can um, just de develop suddenly. Thank you very much. And also, if you could talk about the diagnosis, 
Yes. Um, so diagnosis. Um, so, um, you know, talking about type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. So um, um, typically um, the tests we do are um, uh, the commonest test that most people are um, probably aware of is called a hemoglobin A1C. Um, and that is uh, sugar bound to red cells in your blood. And those cells live for about three months. And so if you measure that and it's slightly elevated, that kind of gives you uh, um, uh, the idea that there maybe they have there's high blood sugar. So diagnosis is usually typically on routine blood tests. If there are some some people may have symptoms such as weight loss, um, you know, going to the bathroom a lot at night, uh, even during the day, increased uh, thirst, increased hunger. Uh, these are all very precipitous or su uh, sudden developments. But most of the time, it's actually just uh, picked up on routine blood testing uh, with either like maybe a high blood glucose was detected or a high A one C, a hemoglobin A1C was picked up on lab testing. So I think uh, something very important for uh, folks to remember is that, uh, you know, please do uh, uh, take your uh, physical exam seriously. That's the time when your physician, your primary care doctor would most uh, often uh, advise labs. And then, uh, you know, if your blood sugar is elevated, they can act on it, but please do take it very seriously. My next question is uh, for you, Whitney. Um, if we have a new diagnosis of diabetes, uh, you know, a primary care doctor has diagnosed it, and you know, there's a patient uh, that uh, is referred to you uh, as a certified diabetes, diabetes educator, what is your role and how do you support patients? That is uh, my first question. And my second question is that we have the Freestyle Libre, which is now available to patients. And it is a very convenient way for them to keep a tab on their blood sugars. I would like to please, uh, for you to please uh, uh, touch upon the Freestyle Libre as well. Thank you. So my role as a diabetes educator and a dietitian is to sort of combine the desires of the provider and the desires of the patient to meet the patient's goals with managing their blood sugar. Um, depending on the education level of the patient, I often just talk about what diabetes is and how it progresses and how to reduce, how to delay that progression. Uh, we talk a lot about their goals and what they would like to do and what's achievable for them and realistic. Uh, the dietitians I work with at UW, we meet our patients where they are. So if they are have a low socioeconomic status or low health literacy, we start really small and make little changes with their diet. You know, we talk about what they're doing every day and what their activity is and just help them make little, little changes, small steps. Sometimes it's just one change. And we meet ongoing. So we have an initial visit for about an hour. And then I meet with my patients with diabetes probably once a month or less if they're if they're very well controlled. We also have diabetes classes now. So our classes are offered about every month and those are covered by Medicare and Medicaid and commercial insurance. And those are currently virtual. So we can sign patients up for that as well. And then as for the Libre, Depending on insurance, um, the Libre is a device that's about the size of a quarter that a patient might wear on the back of their arm. And we can help them put that on or help them find the resources to show them how to put it on. And that is an incredibly useful tool for those who are afraid of pricking their finger or just don't wanna have to be pricking their finger multiple times a day. They can use their phone or they can use a reader and it gives them their blood sugar basically 24 seven. I mean, the Libre 3 now, if, the, if their phone is nearby, it checks their blood sugar all the time. And if they're interested, they can link that data to the clinic. That's awesome. Thank you for giving us that overview, uh, Whitney. And um, uh, it's very important for people to know that if there is a new diagnosis of diabetes or if there is an existing diagnosis of diabetes and they are having trouble uh, you know, with their diagnosis or with taking medication or understanding on how to keep uh, monitoring their blood sugars, there is help available. And uh, uh, for example, Whitney will work closely with the primary care physicians and uh, we form uh, like a team to manage diabetes together. Uh, 
So I think uh, this uh, sort of uh, role is very important for uh, patients to know that is available. Uh, my next question is for Anita? Piyasha. Anita, yes. can I interrupt? Because yes. there's a question in the Q&A that is relevant to the question you asked sure. me about diagnosis, yes. maybe before you go to Priyasha. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, it's an important question. So there's a question in the chat, uh, in the Q&A. Um, so if the A1C test is the test for diabetes, regardless of type, how do you know when a kid has developed type 2 or when an adult has developed type 1 diabetes? Um, these go against assumptions, delaying a type 1 adult's access to insulin, which could kill them. So this is an important question for di diagnosis. So I thought, uh, because we were still <laughs> early in the uh, um the um, discussion. So it's a very important question. So in um, in children, children often are diagnosed with uh, um, with type one diabetes because it's a very dramatic presentation. Um, there's um, weight loss. There's the there's the increased urination. Um, they're just drinking and eating all the time. So that's the dramatic uh, type one diabetes, which requires insulin treatment. However, um, there is now um, uh, you know it, it, it's now evident that a lot of kids are getting type two diabetes, um, which is not as dramatic. Um, the risks are you know, high risk um, heritage, like, you know, people of uh, certain uh, uh, backgrounds, um, uh, uh, people, uh, kids with genetic tendency, family history of type 2 diabetes. Uh, in those situations, uh, it is actually just like an adult's, uh, uh, you know, if there are risks, if the, if the child is on the heavier side and there's other, uh, you know, there's family members um, who have type 2 diabetes, it is again only on routine testing that a, uh, a kid with type 2 diabetes is um, actually often um, uh, detected. Um, the flip side, the other question um, that this um, person is asking is, how about an adult who's diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which is insulin deficient? So this is very important because now we know that 50% of type 1 diabetes, which are, these are the folks who need insulin to survive. These are not the people who take pills. 50% uh, of type 1 diabetes is now actually diagnosed in adults. So this is tricky. Most adults who have any kind of diabetes, you know, typically picked up on lab testing is um, actually just ca uh, labeled as type 2, unfortunately, which is treated with pills. Metformin is the first medication that are often prescribed. Um, it, oftentimes, the metformin will not work. And so that's when the clinician has to you know, look out, watch and see, oh, this person's taking their medication, their blood sugar is not responding. Maybe they're a little bit leaner. Maybe there's family history of thyroid problems, which are autoimmune. So it's very important. This is a very important question. And that's why I interrupted uh, the flow. Um, this is a diagnostic question. And, and thank you for asking this. So um, yeah, so the, the 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 you know, the there's a point here about access to insulin with um, to for adults, and it could kill them. So yes, diagnosis is important, but the, the good thing is in adults with type 1 diabetes, the presentation is not as dramatic as in kids and adolescents. So they're not going to present with ketoacidosis as often as a, a younger individual. That said, there are 20 and 30 year olds who will present with very dramatic presentations and they do need to um, you know, be started on insulin. So I'll stop with that. So sorry. There's actually a follow-up question, uh, uh, Dr. Subramanian, which is which is also re uh, relevant. How would you explain developing diabetes type one at a later age, such as 20 years old, uh, and yes. how can someone develop diabetes type one when no one in their family has it? Yes. So that so type one diabetes. So th these are the people who need insulin to live. So type one diabetes, very often there is no family history. That's actually diagnostic. If it's some lone person, it's like oh, there's nobody in the family with diabetes. It could be type one diabetes. So that's a not, that's a diagnostic. Um, the uh, you know if the if there's a suspicion, so the clinician can order antibody tests towards the you know I um the islet cells which make the insulin, and so if there's a positive antibody, you have a hit there. So that is type one diabetes. Um, lots of times, yeah, adults with type one diabetes are misdiagnosed. It's a huge problem. They get put on medication and they'll float for a bit because the meds will work for a little while, and then um yeah. So um I I hope I answered the question. Um I think I. Got it. Um, yes, I, I forgot uh, if there's any other no, part. The, of that, the, that was the question, and okay. uh, and Dr. Subramanian. So, would you advise primary care physicians to order uh, testing for type one diabetes um, uh, right away when someone is diagnosed, an adult is diagnosed, or 
wait for the therapy uh, therapeutic yeah. trial to see yeah. if the medication like metformin yeah. would work okay uh, excellent question so um I, I history taking is very important um if there is someone who has a family history of type 1 diabetes and you have a person that's sitting in the in the doc, in the doctor's office who is lean on the leaner side doesn't always have to be and there is a family oh my dad or my grandfather had insulin requiring type 1 diabetes was on a pump or whatever that should trigger your diagnostic uh, thing like okay maybe this is type 1 diabetes um and um no, so you you don't really need to order the antibody tests right away. You can actually start them if um, you just need to keep an open mind and not just label everyone as type two diabetes. If the met if the first medication you start and make sure you have them come back for follow up. That's where people like Whitney exist. You know, they, you can have follow up with them. Um, and when um, the medication that you started them on is not touching them for their blood glucose, that's when you start thinking out of the box. It's like okay, this could be just not just bread and butter type one, uh, type two diabetes, uh, which is by far 90% of diabetes is type two diabetes. So uh, it's only 10% that's type one diabetes. So uh, it's just, you know, you just have to keep a, an open diagnostic mind. I know you talked a little bit about this, uh, that 50% um, of the type two, what we think is type two diabetes in adults, maybe type one. So that was another question uh, here in the in the Q and A. Is that right? Uh, so let me clarify that. So yeah. so no. So let let me clarify that numbers. So as I said, most diabetes is type two diabetes can be treated with medications first. But if of all the people who have type one diabetes, um, the many people with type one diabetes are nowadays diagnosed as adults. Mm -hmm. So so you know the incidence of type one diabetes only ten percent of all diabetes. Of that ten per of the people in that ten percent, fifty percent are adults. That's what I meant by that. So, so but yeah, most of type one diabetes nowadays is actually being diagnosed in adu uh, adulthood. That's super helpful. Thank you very much for clarifying that. And uh, I think it's very important for patients to know this as well, and they can advocate uh, for, uh, for the testing themselves yes, as well. Yes. Um, my next question is for Priyasha. Priyasha, you work with, uh, you know, as for a part of your role in, in global health, you work with communities. And how do you think uh, cultural uh, diversity or, uh, you know, cultural differences and uh, consequently dietary differences contribute uh, to developing diabetes? And how do you address, um, you know, uh, sort of culturally sensitive uh, nutritional advice, how do you give that to community members? You are muted. Sorry for that. Thank you for the question, Dr. Chopra. Like Dr. Savita said, certain groups of people, certain ethnicities are more um, at risk of diabetes, developing diabetes than others. For example, South Asian communities have a higher risk um, owing to the both genetic and lifestyle factors. Uh, for example, many South Asians are vegetarians, which means most they have higher, they might have higher um, carbohydrate content in their diet and um, such lead to higher risk as well. Um, and diet is one of the most uh, modifiable and um, mo uh, modifiable risk factors uh, uh, leading to type two diabetes and also for pre-diabetes. Uh, so we we recommend that uh, patients adhere to a healthy plate recommendation, but sometimes being in the US, especially for, non uh, non, uh, for the immigrant communities, for the refugee communities, what it means is the recommendations that come from providers might not um, be tailored to their cultural uh, practices. Like uh, for example, I worked with the Afghan immigrant community in Seattle to create a food guide. What we found was they were mostly referred to um, resorting to uh, breakfast cereals and oats, um, more fruits and vegetables, which does not really, really, they could not relate to it. And that means they, could, they would not adhere to it on a longer run. Um, we understand that patients want to eat with their families. And when they are doing so, they want to eat eat the same food that their family members are. Um, and that is why we try to understand what the community is practicing on a day-to-day -day basis, what their diets are, what the ingredients in their kitchen look like. And we try to 
modify our recommendations based on what they would they could they can relate to and what they are most likely to adapt in their everyday life. Um, so we try to practice cultural humility around our recommendations and referrals, and we try to create content based on the patient's requirements and needs. So that is how we are catering to the communities in Seattle. Um, and there are there are there are a vast uh, pool of information on the website about about diet, about exercise, about everything, but we can see that most of them are based on the American uh, Association of Health. Um, and then they they provide recommendations based on the lifestyle here. But then there are also some resources like the Ethnomed and Harborview Medical Center that try to tailor um, information to the to different um, different clientels based on their cultural preferences and practices. So that is what we are trying to do. That's so helpful. Thank you so much, Priyasha. And we will put in information about Ethnomed in the chat. And uh, it's a great resource for culturally uh, diverse uh, nutrition, uh, uh, you know, resource. And uh, uh, there's a lot of information available on the Ethnomed website. Uh, I will switch gears a little bit. Uh, and Dr. Subramaniam, uh, let's talk a little bit about the medication. What are the first line medications um, and metformin, you know, most people know metformin. And, uh, and there are, uh, you know, certain groups of people who, who uh, you know, metformin cannot be used for. So please, can you talk a little bit about medications? And, and then we will also talk about newer medications. But if you can talk a little bit about the first line medications for a newly diagnosed diabetic. Okay. So, um, with type 2 diabetes in 2023, um, the treatment is actually um, individualized. So you first, um, uh, the person who has developed diabetes, the, the question um, we need to ask is, does this person have, does the person have any heart disease or kidney disease? And if that answer is yes, there are certain medications we would pick. And if there's no heart disease or kidney disease that is already present, which is most people uh, when they're first diagnosed, um, lots of times, um, then we um, look at whether this person needs just glucose, or blood glucose lowering, or whether there's um, there's benefit from um, you know reducing weight also. So so weight and blood sugar are actually treated equally in 2023 um, because. Um, not everyone, but a lot of people with type 2 diabetes can benefit from weight loss. Again, this is not a blanket statement. It's highly individualized. Uh, there are people who are lean who have type 2 diabetes. So you really have to um, you know, um, look at it uh, holistically as a whole person who's uh, sitting in front of you as a, as a clinician. So I notice I said, uh, I did not say anything about metformin. So yes, metformin has been around long time and it is been thought to be the first line medication. It's easy, it's a pill. Um, many people are able to take it. Um, it helps um, uh, your tissue, body tissues handle um, uh, glucose ba uh, better by improving what we call insulin sensitivity. Um, I think it is still um, the first line medication because it is for the reasons I just mentioned, but the American Diabetes Association doesn't say you need to start insulin as your first line therapy for type two diabetes anymore in 2023. As I said, you first, you know, look at the person sitting in front of you. What are their needs? What is that? What are their characteristics? If there's heart disease or renal disease, there is a possibility we might go something other than metformin, uh, which is where we will come into the newer medications. Or is it, you know, it is blood sugar plus minus weight loss. So and then we pick um, different, uh, you know, again, uh, one of the newer medications. So you asked about, talk about the newer medications. So actually the newer medications have moved way up um, in the list of um, um, treatments uh, for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, the medications we've used uh, um, for many years, which are less 
cheap, actually, very inexpensive, have actually gone way lower in our list of uh, um, diabetes medications because these newer medications have now been studied and, and they have a lot of uh, benefits uh, from a kidney standpoint, heart standpoint, that they, they have beneficial aspects. Um, so I will talk about the newer medications that I've um, uh, referred to. So there's two classes uh, of medications. One are medications that work primarily on the kidney. Um, you may have heard of uh, um, all of these meds. There's a lot of direct-to-consumer marketing, um, so I will use the brand names. I have no conflict of interest. Um, the drugs that work on the kidney and help you lose sugar in your urine, um, these are called SGLT2 inhibitors. There's uh, three commonly used medications, Jardians, Invokana, Farsiga. They have they all end with flozin, um, empagliflozin, um, um, dapagliflozin and um, uh, canagliflozin are the are the actual drug names, uh, but um, these help you lose sugar in the urine and um, help you uh, lose a little bit of weight. Uh, there's kidney protective effects. They prevent, um, uh, they can lower blood pressure a little bit. You can lose about six pounds um, on these medications and they're oral medications. So um, they uh, are very helpful for people who have maybe underlying kidney disease or um, heart failure, heart failure as in, uh, you know, problems with the uh, heart pumping effects. Um, so that's the class of medications uh, um, we would use in someone who might have some of those characteristics. Um, um, if someone has already um, heart disease, like a heart attack, or has had a stroke or mini stroke, um, we would use a different medication, and that those would um, um, be the medications uh, which we would also be using in someone who didn't have that, but where we were looking at weight. And these are the ones that have literally blown up in our, um, you know, in our media feeds, and the, the, they are called GLP-1 receptor agonists. And these are the drugs that are commonly known as Ozempic, Trulicity. Um, these are um, the weekly meds. There's daily medication called Victoza. Uh, so these are the drugs that are used for either weight loss or if you have someone with heart disease uh, for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, and I can stop there. And if you want me to expand, I'm happy to expand more. I think, yes, I think, uh, Dr. Subramanian, let's talk about uh, these medications. And uh, because there is so much demand for Ozempic uh, uh, with or without uh, type 2 diabetes, especially in people who are overweight. So please, yes, please uh, talk about Ozempic a little bit and who are eligible, uh, you know, and we have so many requests from patients now to start them on this medication. Yes. So yes, let's talk yeah. about it. Yeah, so um, so Ozempic um, is, so the, the drug name for Ozempic is semaglutide. Um, this drug is given once a week as an injection. So the company that makes it markets semaglutide in two different brand names. One is Ozempic, the other one is Wegovy. These are exactly same drug, but they are marketed and dosed slightly differently. Uh, Ozempic is for people with type 2 diabetes, where Govi is for people with who are requiring just weight loss. So it's a weight medication, but it's the exact drug. Okay, so um, if it's only for, so Wegovy is the one which would be prescribed if someone is just looking, um, you know, from, from a weight loss perspective. Um, so these are, um, have been out uh, for several years now. Um, they are very effective glucose lowering drugs. Uh, the, the semaglutide, the other one, the cousin of semaglutide is uh, dulaglutide or trulicity. Uh, that hasn't hit the um, press as much because it doesn't have a weight loss uh, indication. It's a primarily a diabetes drug, uh, but it does the same thing. So these, what they do is they work on the brain to suppress the appetite center and make you feel full. And so it increases your satiety. So you don't feel hungry as much. The other things they do is they slow down your stomach and delay the emptying of the stomach. So it causes a natural slowing of the stomach motility. Uh, and then it also works on the pancreas to help the pancreas make more insulin, which helps the sugar in the blood, glucose, move into your tissues. So it has a lot of different actions. Um, because it works on the appetite center in the brain, it suppresses appetite. So people don't feel as hungry. And so the portion sizes decrease and they eat lesser and there is weight loss. So... Um, when there's weight loss, there's also benefit from a diabetes standpoint. So there's all these different ways these medications work. Um, 
they uh, and because they're so potent, they work for people with type two diabetes. It helps with weight loss, and um, um, yeah. So so they're they're actually really good medications um, for that purpose. When you are looking for just weight um, um, weight loss, the Ozempic is not. Uh, it's not the approved version. It is Wegovy, which is the branding of some of that drug for weight loss. So that's why people who um, you know, sometimes ask for Zempic. It's not the branding for weight loss, so you may not your insurance may not pay for it. That said, even the best commercial insurance doesn't like to pay for weight loss medications, so it's really hard to get these drugs these days. So, you, if you have a clear indication for a diabetes uh, diagnosis, then you can actually get um, these medications there. Um, yeah. So, so Vigovi, uh, you talked about that. You talked about prolicity. And does Victoza also offer uh, the added advantage of weight loss? Yes. So Victoza, the drug name is liraglutide. So that's actually the, the medication that came out first for in this whole class for diabetes management. So that liraglutide is branded two ways. That is, again, um, um, Lira, uh, Victoza is daily injections for diabetes, and it is also marketed for weight loss alone as Saxenda. And the dosing is slightly different, but it's the same drug. It is just marketed differently and dosed slightly differently. Uh, and with the weight loss dose, you can go higher. Uh, so, so those are so that's actually the medication that came out first, and uh, also has the same benefits. Except that the difference is that you have to inject yourself every day, um, and the potency is much better with the weekly drugs. Now we know that um, than with the daily medication. So that's why there's been a shift towards the the weekly preparations, and it's the convenience and the ease of use. Um, we haven't talked about cost, but um, you can let me know when I should get into that. <laughs> so. Yes, please go ahead. Talk about that as well. Yeah, because yeah, we are so. already on that topic. Yeah, so cost. Um, so most commercial insurances will cover these medications. Um, if you have commercial insurance um, and you have the right indication. So if you have diabetes, you can get Ozempic or Trulicity covered. Um, and um, however, many, most insurances don't want to cover weight loss medication. So that's where the struggle happens. These are all expensive, expensive drugs. If you pay out of pocket, it's about $1,000 or $1,200 a month. Um, so that is commercial insurance. With the state Medicaid plans, um, actually, you can actually get these medications these days. Um, the They like to start, uh, so with the state, all the five uh, Medicaid plans uh, will cover the weekly medication if you go through certain steps. If you've already had people on metformin and you're, the, so you've taken your metformin and the, maybe the blood sugars are not as good and there's need for weight loss, um, you know, it's not the the insurance plan, Medicaid plans sometimes want you to go on the daily one, which is Victoza, and you can always say that it didn't work after a few months, and then you can say we tried these two and they failed on this, and you can actually get the weekly medication in your state Medicaid plans. If the person has heart disease, you can actually get it even without trying the weekly. So that's the good part about the Medicaid plans for Washington. But Medicare is a whole other story. Um, it's really hard because Medicare plans, um, it, it, it's the cost. Um, they will, you, you may get, uh, it's slightly less expensive in the beginning of the year, but it's really hard for a lot of seniors um, who need these medications, um, but because monthly costs may be $300, uh, which is a lot. It can be $150, which is still a lot. So, so cost is a big, big, black box, which it's it's really hard um, for, um, you know, for our older folks. Um, and don't even get me started by self-pay. I mean, I just told you what the cost was. It's just, I mean, yeah, unless you're a Hollywood celebrity type who can spend $1,200 a month, it's really hard. Well, thank you so much. This this is really good information. This is really valuable uh, for our patients and for us primary care physicians as well. Uh, Whitney, my next question is for you. It's on the Freestyle Libre. And we received this question from the community. I have a Freestyle Libre measuring my sugar levels and it shows that my sugar will go up after it had gone down on its own, even though I did not eat anything after 11 p.m. Why does my blood sugar go up when I do strenuous exercise? So there's two parts to this question. And uh, if you can talk, take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the freestyle debris and if it's covered, uh, 
uh, by insurances. So the question about why it goes up at night after they haven't eaten anything, um, that could be for any variety of reasons. Um, maybe they're not sleeping well, or maybe they had a nightmare and they're stressed, or, I mean, usually I think the liver makes more sugar closer to the morning. But yeah, that could be any variety of reasons. The why does it go up after exercise? If it's a strenuous exercise, that can actually be a stressor on the body, which causes the blood sugar to temporarily go up. But that's not necessarily a negative thing because the long-term effects will be lower blood sugar later. And as for coverage, um, for commercial insurance, it just de it depends on the type of insurance. A lot of them cover the, the Freestyle Libre, but they might cover it with a high copay. And then Medicare covers if the patient requires at least one injection of insulin. And we can help them with that. And then Medicaid is a little bit more complicated. So they often do not cover, but they may cover if a patient has uh, requires insulin, multiple injections of insulin. So the, the way to get a freestyle Libre prescribed is to go through their primary care doctors who can prescribe it, but you could uh, uh, you would be able to walk people through on how to use it. Is that is that what I understand? Yes, they can come in and meet in person and we can guide them on how to use it. But there are also a lot of you know YouTube videos with headings that walk you through every step of how to put it on and how to use it. Excellent. Uh, Priyasha, my next question is about diet. And uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, nutritional uh, counseling and talking to patients as well as uh, support. I have a question uh, from the community. Are there other things than medication or insulin that can help with this kind of, uh, with, the, with the diabetes control? And what, what should be, uh, people be doing? Uh, do you teach them to count carbohydrate intake? Or, or do you teach them in general on how to keep a good glycemic control? Uh, uh, it's more about, the question is more about specifics in terms of diet and exercise to fight diabetes. Thank you. Um, there are multiple risk factors that can be addressed with physical activity and diet. Diet especially because uh, it is also associated with cholesterol, lipid levels in the blood. Um, with blood pressure and um, that is why we focus on more on diet than other things physical exercise to keep yourselves healthy to um, check the weight um, but I personally because I'm not a practice practicing dietitian I do not teach patients on um, carbohydrate counting calorie counting or glycemic index but we do recommend inclusion of um, healthy carbohydrate rather than eliminating carbohydrate from diet. Um, so we, we recommend inclusion of whole grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables in the diet. And we, um, we um, promote this healthy plate that has been created by the American, uh, American Association that has, that shows the proportion of carbohydrate to vegetables to protein um, in a plate and how um, every meal for a diabetic patient, um, a, any patient with diabetes should consider uh, every day. So uh, I do not know if we have that. We do have that in our Afghan food guide, the, the diet plate. So we recommend following that and adhering to that. So um, I I apologize. I cannot comment on the glycemic No, but we can we can put that information in as well about my healthy plate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Subramaniam, the next question is, what are the recommendations on treating type 1.5 diabetes? And how often do you see this type? Okay, so again, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> um, so type, there, um, type 1.5 diabetes is... Um, you know, essentially people with type 1 diabetes, so these are the folks who need insulin, um, who are a little bit on the heavier side and have insulin resistance. So the average BMI, the body mass index, 
in a person with type 1 diabetes is actually 30. So they are on the, in the US. Uh, so that just means that, you know, generally bodies are getting larger, people are weighing a little bit more, because type 1 diabetes, usually people thought that, you know, you have a lean person who develops diabetes, it's type 1 diabetes, but that's not the case anymore. So you have, um, that's what is typically labeled as type 1.5 diabetes. That is really not a recognized labeling in the by the American Diabetes Association. It is how, um, as a specialist, how I describe these people are people with type 1 diabetes who have um, high insulin requirements. So meaning they need a lot of insulin. That's what we call insulin resistance. Insulin resistance also is not, it's not a very nice term to use. Um, so it's type 1 diabetes with high insulin requirements. So if in these folks, if you um, have um, uh, an indication to lower their weight, you would think that P, uh, dr medications like these GLP-1 um, agonists, the, the Ozempic and the Trulicity will help. And they actually do. Um, they can help with weight loss and they can help bring their um, insulin requirements down. So um, it's a, it's a, and insulin does help cause weight gain. So you can cut, break that cycle and, and it can be beneficial. However, these are not FDA approved for people with type 1 diabetes. So often are not um, approved by in, even the best insurance. Because if you have a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, um, most insurances will say denied. So um, what do you do then? Um, so sometimes the patient cannot, so we can ask doctors. So I have written appeal letters to insurance many times for people. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the patients take it on themselves and advocate for themselves, which is amazing. And it actually works better than a doctor advocating for them because um, it that's just the way insurance companies are. Um, so uh, I've had patients who advocate for themselves. Uh, um, so there was a period of time when we were able to get these medications. There wasn't as many shortages. So um, there are people who we had started who are, uh, you know, this 1.5, a little bit on the heavier side. Um, and and then insurance started, stopped covering. So, um, and then that's when people started advocating for themselves. That said, it is not an approved indication. So it's what we, we would call off-label. So you'd have to have a discussion with the patient, but it does work. Um, I mean, these medications do work. So um, it, there's a... a impossible to get it covered. Uh, the same thing will uh, hap uh, happen with Medicare. Uh, Medicaid will not cover if you have a diagnosis of type 1 and you're on the heavier side and you need weight loss. So, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 those nitty-gritties are so important for uh, for us. So thank you so much for sharing those. On that same note, there's a question. Um, heard recently that insurances will begin requiring prior authorizations, for example. Mm -hmm. How can so we help yeah. our patients who need it for yeah. diabetes? So most um, insurances will need prior authorizations. That's a, that's the world of insurance. I don't want to get into that <laughs> and say bad words. So unfortunately, that is the insurance industry. Um, adding paperwork to our daily lives and um, um, more and more barriers. Um, these drugs, they do need prior authorization. What that means is you send the request uh, to the pharmacy, the pharmacy will pass it through and they'll say, oh, prior authorization required. If, if the clinician documents saying that this person has type two diabetes, BMI is this, um, whatever metformin did not work, um, need so good, clear documentation. Um, the the prior authorization essentially means the um, uh, the insurance wants to see certain keywords. And if those are in there, they'll pass it through and you'll get it. So it's just like a barrier, layers to get through. And how can you help your patients get them? Uh, a good team. Uh, so from the doctor's side, good documentation, clear, simple documentation, using some keywords, um, which uh, can help, uh, you know, whoever's working this. Uh, and then a good staff who, who, who is trained and is patient and can um, put the paperwork through. Um, in the UW, we have the prior, uh, the prior authorization teams who that's, so that's what the prior authorization team does. They will look at the doctor's note and see what's written there. What keywords are there? What codes have they put in? And that's, they'll just pass it through. And if you've got a good note, you're, you're, uh, from the doctor, you, um, uh, chart note, uh, that, sh that should do it. But yeah, it is an extra barrier. Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, Whitney, now my next question is for you. Uh, there's a, it's a question from the Q and A. My mom is 86, has type 2 diabetes. She refuses to poke her finger, uh, but I am not in Seattle to monitor her uh, blood sugar levels. Uh, her last A1C was 7.1. She's on metformin. So the, the question is, what other ways can this be managed and monitored? Uh, I will take this question to ask you about the Libre, the freestyle Libre. If someone has a freestyle Libre, for example, in this case, uh, an 86 year old patient can their uh, you know their kids or whoever is a guardian can they uh, monitor blood sugar sitting far away is that possible uh, i actually saw that question and was thinking about it and i was going to say that a person who's 86 years old and has an a1c of seven it's actually very well controlled in my opinion i wouldn't necessarily need it to be any lower than that but yes if the patient was open to it they could wear a Libre and they could, um, you know, they can share their data with their children. They can send, you know, their, their children can have access to their account. Uh, but the Libre might not be covered for Medicare for a person who doesn't require insulin. But again, an 86 year old with an A1EC of 7.1 is, I think, very good. Savita might have. 100% agree with Whitney. <laughs> yes, that's a fantastic A1C for an 86 year old. Um, yeah, and there's no way Medicare is going to cover the Libre. Um, I mean, you can pay pay out of pocket um, and and get it. Uh, but uh, I mean, I agree. Uh, I don't know that uh, she needs further uh, monitoring. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, Dr. Subramanian, the next question is about the uh, side effects of metformin. There's a question in the in the yeah. Q and A. How can you na navigate the negative effects of metformin? I'm on Trulicity and metformin. Mm -hmm. I was on Trulicity, Genuvia and metformin and the negative effects were under control. The insurance stated that Genuvia was no longer formulary and now Montezuma is back to stay. Any suggestions uh, okay. about that? Okay. So, um, so the question is, so what, what do you do in someone who has side effects on metformin? And the commonest side effect on metformin is GI stomach. Um, um, but, so uh, cramping, diarrhea can be very troublesome in some people. And that's what it sounds like in this uh, person. Um, you know, you try. So usually what clinicians do is you'll start with one preparation of metformin, then you get changed to an extended release, which may be easier on the stomach. But here's where this is a very important question. And thank you for asking this question, whoever asked it, because if a person has diarrhea, really bad diarrhea on metformin, it is just really a bad idea to push it. Yes, it's a great medication, but there are some people who just run to the bathroom five days a week, uh, uh, five times a day. I had a, a woman who came to me like, I mean, she's working and she has to run to the bathroom from meetings five times. That's not a good thing. So if the medication is causing side effects that affect quality of life, just take away the drug, even as good as it might be. So um, some people may be able to take the lowest dose, but some just cannot tolerate metformin for whatever reason. Um, so I would say if it is really troublesome, please go off of the metformin. There are other medications available. It sounds like this person was on Trulicity, which is a weekly injectable. Um, if you're on um, uh, Genuvia, uh, Genuvia is the pill version or it's a weaker version of um, that same class of meds. You shouldn't be taking the pill and the, uh, the Genuvia and the Trulicity together. So the Genuvia should be taken away. But uh, in someone with stomach side effects on metformin, um, you really just need to go off of it um, if you can't take just even one pill a day and just go to other medications for managing your diabetes. Uh, it can be done. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Priyasha, the next question is for you. Uh, for people who have pre-diabetes, who are not yet diabetic, who have risk factors, and uh, you know they come to you for uh, uh, counseling. What kind of resources do you have available to the community uh, in terms of their diet and lifestyle changes? Um, well, the diabetes plate is for everybody. It's um, I would recommend everybody to take that beyond that the the plate method and portion sizing. Um, methodology to con to have that control on diet but for pre-diabetic patients uh, pre people with pre-diabetes I uh, we would suggest dietary modification alongside being physically active and maintaining that lifestyle um, 
And nowadays, because of our work module, it's it's quite hard to get that physical activity uh, incorporated in our everyday life. So just to be aware of that and um, and practicing that. And in terms of um, in terms of meal planning, I know counting the carb is easier with some of the mobile applications that are there, but also uh, being aware that serving size and portion size for food are not the same thing. And um, we can intentionally choose to portion our food and choose to eat um, a specific amount of food such that uh, it does not add to the the carbohydrate burden on our digestive system. So just being aware of those things. Um, yeah. May I add to that, Anita? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The diabetes, there's also the diabetes prevention program at the YMCA, which doctors can refer to now to refer their patients to, which is an excellent program. Yeah. That's wonderful. No, thank you very much. If we can share this in the chat, the information in the chat, that will be great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Subramaniam, I, uh, my next question for you is, actually, it's very relevant. Uh, I heard uh, you talking at the ACT meeting uh, recently, and I thought that this was very relevant to our patients, is the cost of insulin. And we see a lot of patients who, uh, you know, avoid the Lantus and uh, uh, short-acting insulin, and they go on to choosing uh, insulin 70-30 because of the cost. Uh, how can folks deal with it? And what do you advise your patients who have a hard time affording insulin? Yeah, so this is a tough one, but it's gotten better this year with the um, the the act that um, our, our current president, um, uh, President Biden passed. I forget exactly what it's called, but Affordable Insulin Act or something like that. Um, so the insulin price of uh, any insulin is capped at $35 um, a prescription. I think um, so um, for so people who need insulin, if you have commercial insurance, all the in, um, the all insurances have certain preferred insulins on their list and they'll cover whatever's on their formulary list. Uh, and that could be, there's um, there's insulins like branded insulins like Lantus and versions of Lantus. Um, those are the um, you know, the um, they're a type of insulin, which are called analog insulins, and they are more expensive. But those have also now um, become more available and less expensive because there are generic versions or cheaper versions of them available. Um, if you have, um, uh, um, so, so that's commercial insurance. Washington Medicaid will cover whatever's on their list, um, um, which is, you know, which could be whatever their preferred insulin is. Um, but but I think uh, um, Anita, your specific question is for someone who um, uh, maybe is self-pay or has limited resources um, yes. and um, you know cannot afford to pay you know out of pocket for insulin. And there are many many people like that. So what do you do then? So uh, in that situation, there's um, um, I, uh, we usually send people to Walmart because Walmart has twenty a uh, vial of. Um, um, certain types of insulin that are actually branded for them, which is actually made in the same factory as the branded insulin. Um, so the the Walmart brand insulin, it, it's uh, $24.98 or whatever. Um, so it's under $25 for a vial. Um, so that's one option. And that, so when that's the situation, when you use pre-mixed insulin, pre-mixed insulin has um, two insulins together. One is a short acting insulin, and then there's a, a longer or an intermediate acting insulin. And that can, uh, that can be helpful. So my, um, um, so what I would say is so it's better than taking nothing. Uh, and having high blood sugar. So if you are, uh, if a person's able to afford, um, you know, to buy um, insulin from the cheapest source, I would encourage them to go to the source that they're able to afford. That said, like places like, you know, UW, uh, we have um, uh, the special pricing. UW, we can get the same insulin per while for $10. So, um, because I think it's 403B pricing, I think it's called. Um, uh, so that that's a source for cheaper insulin. Um, it's hard. Um, uh, none of this is easy. Diabetes is a chronic condition like none other. There is so much burden. Um, it it interferes and enters every aspect of an individual's life. Um, you know, just activities of daily living, your um, inner um, 
personal relationships, everything. So these are all burdens that people carry and we have to be supporting and uh, supportive and give people uh, resources as they need. So um, yeah, so usually Walmart is cheap insulin, but as I said, um, for Medicare individuals, that price of insulin is capped. Uh, if you're paying out of pocket, I'd say go, uh, Walmart is a good source for buying insulin or um, here uh, for us, uh, um, University of Washington, our pharmacies um, will get good pricing for you if the prescription is sent by a UW pro provider to the UW pharmacy. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Subramanian. This has been so immensely useful. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I think that uh, this topic is so vast that we probably need additional uh, uh, conversations on this. And uh, you know, I would request Priscilla to consider that, but this brings us to the end of uh, today's session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Subramaniam, Whitney, Priyasha. Thank you very much. It was so good to uh, have this valuable discussion. Yeah, and such amazing questions and participation from the community. I'm glad to see that there's interest. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Glad to be a part of it. Thank you everyone so much for joining. I'm going to leave the room open for a couple of minutes. I know there are a lot of links that I've put into the chat, so I'll leave it open um, so you can go in there and open up those links for um, your own future reference and resources. Um, thank Again, thank you so much for joining us. I agree, it was such a lively conversation and really appreciate all of the um, questions in the Q&A today and the participation. Um, please look forward to our future sessions and uh, take care. We'll see you next time.